substantial quantity of carbon, a vital component in strategies to bend the curve of greenhouse gas concentration in the decades to come. We must have outdoor as well as indoor lab laboratories to conduct research in this area. And a new building at Kendall Frost will help us do this. The new field station and learning center at the reserve will be built on the site of the existing 55 year old dilapidated trailer that I know many of you have visited. The new building will provide modern laboratories to conduct research focused on climate change and sea level rise. The building itself will also provide a large multi-purpose room to serve as a classroom, space to house scientists and students overnight, a deck for bird watching, and a community event space where we can welcome members of the surrounding communities in the San Diego area into our space and talk to them about the science that we're doing. Over the years, the Kendall Frost Marsh Reserve has provided a field site for research and training by groups or individuals from the fields of restoration ecology, biological oceanography, invertebrate zoology, natural history, and marine biodiversity and conservation. The marsh is also widely used by researchers from other UC campuses, US and international universities, community colleges, local businesses, government agencies, and K-12 schools. And we're really proud of the work that we do at the Kendall Frost Reserve because it, it combines our cutting edge research and everything from the ecology of parasites and free living animals um, to understanding how habitat restoration can affect the reproductive history of killifish and the Ridgeway's rail population with our mission of outreach, public outreach and education. And we're proud of these partnerships with local agencies and local schools to bring them into our research mission and to help them engage in their own research missions where um, these are really fabulous and creative educational and research efforts that are the heart of what we do. We're grateful also with our continued partnership with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the UC Natural Reserve System as the Kendall, Marsh, Kendall Frost Marsh Reserve continues to thrive and make a positive impact on our community by providing this valuable asset, asset to educate the public and protect the environment. I'd like to offer my sincere thanks again to each of you who have donated to the new Kendall Frost Marsh Reserve Field Station. Your support is helping to make this new space a reality. And we've almost reached our fundraising goal. And Chris Sickles will provide a fundraising effort update at the end of the meeting. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dick Norris, academic director of the UCSD Natural Reserve System and professor of paleobiology at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Dick, turn it over okay. to you. Yeah, all right. So. Um... Isaac, could you start my slides, I suppose? So I have, a, I have a set of slides to show all of you. First of all, I want to thank you all for coming uh, today and to hear this uh, presentation to sort of see sort of where we are, you know, in the development uh, of, a, um, of this new building that we're talking about in Kendall Frost. And so now if you can go to presenter view, there you go, excellent. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm the, the uh, NRS uh, academic uh, director, and you'll hear later on also from uh, Heather Henter, who's the uh, executive director for the NRS and, and us. And my job today is to tell you about the research and some of the community engagement that we're up to. Um, and uh, next slide. Uh, so, Isaac, could you? Yeah. Okay, so there is what we're trying to replace. Okay, that is our lovely old house trailer uh, that has stood uh, by and been a, a marvelous uh, uh, resource for us. You know, it's a, our main laboratory there in Kendall Frost. So we based a lot of research out of this old credit building, um, but we're trying to replace it with next. Okay, the next slide. Uh, is uh, hopefully, yeah, is that thing, okay? So this will be the Kendall Frost Field Station and Learning Center. We're actually starting the process of building this thing right now. Uh, so we haven't quite finished the fundraising, which of course is a, a point of, uh, you know, reason for this particular meeting, but we are uh, on the way towards uh, getting the uh, permitting done, the, the site planning and things like that. And um, as uh, Kit mentioned, you know, the whole sort of left side of this building is a big uh, community resources center. It's a, a, a big room that we can use for uh, uh, instruction, for example, for high school students, um, or for community events or for research efforts. So that's what we're all about. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the research we hope to do out of that 
uh, new building. So next slide. Um, so this is what Mission Bay used to look like, okay? Before the 19, sort of the mid to late 1940s, you can see over there on the left, uh, 1937, that's an aerial view of Mission Bay. Candle Frost is in the uppermost uh, uh, right corner of that. Um, but there is a big extensive uh, wetland area from the mouth of the San Diego River that used to fill in a good deal of um, of Mission Bay. And then that, of course, as we know, was all sort of terraformed uh, by bulldozers to create the present uh, day, um, uh, you know, system that we have in, in, uh, in Mission Bay. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is an aerial view of what Candle Frost looks like. Uh, and you can see down there in the lower right is our field station, that house trailer I mentioned. Um, and then over on the left is uh, Camp Land on the Bay. Uh, this is a um, set of properties that are, that are owned by the city of San Diego uh, and are uh, slated to be turned back into marsh at some point. And so a key issue for us uh, within the university is to try to figure out how you do that kind of restoration. And fortunately, we've got this, it's admittedly a postage stamp, but we've got this piece of, of old marsh, you know, the, the original marsh that is still there to be able to show us the way, you know, towards how you do a more extensive restoration plan. And I should point out that you can see the main uh, channel there that's running out uh, into uh, Mission Bay. And that's actually the old course of Rose Creek. Uh, that has since been channelized. Um, and right sort of smack in the middle of the photograph is a, a large sort of rectangular area, which is actually also city property. That is a property that um, is called the Northern Wildlife Refuge. Uh, and it was set aside by the city to be restored to marsh, but they haven't done anything about that for the last 30 years or so. <laughs> so there's a number of different projects going on. First to restore the Northern Wildlife Refuge, uh, to think about uh, turning camp land on the bay back into marshland as well. And the key questions, you know, for us in the university are how to do that. Uh, and, and what are some of the benefits that accrue to the city, to all of us uh, in the community if we, if we do this kind of restoration effort? So next slide. All right, so one of the key issues is that we know that climate change is going on. And this is a, a um, uh, so-called Surging Seas website. You can go and visit this yourself and play with the slider over on the, on the left, which is the, um, is the sea level, all right? And, we, and this, by, by the way, so you can see Mission Bay there in the middle and all the sort of uh, medium blue areas are areas expected to be inundated in the future. Uh, and it depends of course, upon you know, what sea level is, of course. And then there's also other things like storm surge and king tides. And king tides happen all the time, uh, well, every year anyway, uh, and they can amount to up to seven feet of sea level, sort of temporary sea level rise. But then when you add that on top of the, the global sea level rise, which is estimated to be between three and four feet by the end of the century, now you start seeing you know, extensive inundation of lands that, um, you know, that, uh, that we inhabit. And San Diego just recently did an assessment of this. They were required by uh, a state law to look at so-called state grant lands, which include the area around Mission Bay. Actually, it's almost exclusively the area around Mission Bay for San Diego. Uh, and they assessed that the city's liabilities uh, because of storm surge flooding or sea level rise amount to a bit over $500 million by another 10 years from now, not very long, uh, and $1.2 billion by the end of the century. And that is striking because, um, you know, you just think about how much uh, sort of coastline that San Diego has, uh, the city's liabilities from sea level rise are very large. Um, now, the key point is, like, what could we do to mitigate that? And uh, you can see Kendall Frost um, Marsh is up there kind of in the, in the middle center of the, of the image, uh, sort of surrounded by a lands that will be flooded. <laughs> uh, and so the key question is what to do about that. How could, we, how could we reduce the amount of flooding in the future? Next slide. Uh, another slide. Um, Sorry about I that, Dick. It's not letting 
My computer's freezing up a bit, so just give me a moment. Uh, maybe Martha can share. Um, well, I can also just say a little bit more too. You can see, I was gonna show you a picture, sort of a more detailed picture of the northern part of Mission Bay. Um, and you can yeah. see what's called the Dianza Boot there. Um, the Dianza Boot is a, uh, let's see, I guess we'll probably try restarting this. One moment. Um, there. I got it. Thank, you. Thank you, Martha. This is the loveliness of being, uh, now if you can <laughs> move some slides back. <laughs> You can okay. see actually the slide there. Uh, yeah, the Dianza Amendment uh, slide is what we want to go to. Great. Okay. Uh, and you're you're in presenter view at the moment. I don't know if it's possible. I don't really care, but uh, other people might be distracted by my next slides. <laughs> okay. Let me let me remove that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so the the city is currently undergoing a planning process. Uh, for what's called the Dianza Amendment. And this is a, um, an old trailer park up in Northern Mission Bay. It's adjacent to the Mission Bay High School and to the Mission Bay Golf Course, uh, as well as Mission Bay Park. And um, the key issue here is what to do with that old um, uh, set of uh, trailer homes. And so the city has agreed with the Dianza Corporation or the Gelfin, uh, Gelfin family, I guess, to uh, lease that city land to them for another, I think there's another six years or seven years uh, on their lease. Um, now, can you go, can you make it actually slideshow? Yeah, I'm trying. Uh -huh. you know, yeah, 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 there you go. Uh, slideshow. Sure. Let's see if you're I'm at the very bottom, right? Okay. Yeah, 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 you're, yeah, excellent way. Okay, way to go. <laughs> this, is the, this is the modern life, you know, to, uh, to deal with uh, Zoom issues. Um, any case, so the Dianza boot, you can see it's that old sort of developed area. And you can also see channelized Rose Creek there too, right smack in the middle of the image. Kendall Frost is over on the left, uh, Campland is next to that, and then you come to Rose Creek. And so the key question for the city is, you know, well, what's going to happen to this property? And they have a development plan they've been working on for a while that would uh, extend basically this kind of RV camping on the bay uh, for time in, in, immemorial. Um, but uh, there's a coalition that includes the university that is arguing for what's called the wildest uh, 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 plan, which is to do extensive marsh restoration across this whole area. And so if you show the next slide, then you can see my vision uh, for what we would do. Um, this is something I presented in the city a couple of years ago. Uh, and here the idea is to create a living shoreline uh, so that we would protect that uh, Mission Bay High School right there in the middle upper part of the image. And then across uh, Rose Creek is the Mission Bay uh, golf course uh, that would also be protected by this living shoreline. And of course the city could do whatever they wanted to with the protected lands. Um, but the, the idea is to build up a marsh that would impede uh, the, the flood tides that come from king tides and from uh, future sea level rise uh, by essentially building up a marsh over a period of time uh, and allowing it to, to continue to act as a natural uh, wall, you know, a green wall against uh, the city, uh, against the, um, the uh, flood tides. And another feature of this also is to see, to, to de-channelize Rose Creek and the main point of that is that that reduces this, the rate at which uh, storm surges would move up a uh, river and potentially flood uh, you know, occupied parts of Pacific Beach. Um, so these two issues, one is to create a, you know, a slowly a grading uh, system and then also to de-channelize the river. Um, and also by de-channelizing the river, we'd make much more extensive habitat and much better habitat uh, for all the animals uh, that live in the marsh. And I believe also a much better place for like tourism, like bird watching and things like that. So next slide. Um, so one of the experiments that we're doing right now, okay, we're trying to do a couple of things that will convince the city that they ought to do this marsh restoration. And one of them is something that Kit mentioned, which is trying to assess the value of all the carbon uh, in the form of squash plants uh, that exists in our marshes. And so you see in the upper uh, right there is a core taken out of a marsh, not, not ours, uh, that has these black stripes through it. And those black stripes are peat, which is basically compressed plant material that is 
carbon. Uh, and that carbon has a value for the city's climate action plan. You can actually put a, a dollar value on a storage of carbon in marshlands. And so uh, just this coming uh, weekend, we're gonna go off and take a core out of uh, Kendall Frost Mission Bay Marsh, uh, and we'll start this process of doing a, a, a carbon sequestration valuation, an economic valuation of the marsh. Um, and then we'll also be doing experiments to see uh, how much carbon you might be able to store in a marsh uh, in, if we do some of this restoration of now developed lands uh, like camp land or the Deonza property. Uh, because those, those soils no longer have a lot of carbon in them, but we might be able to amend the amount of carbon that they store by using, for example, um, compost from the city's um, uh, waste uh, management system uh, or uh, green waste, for example, grass clippings and things like that that's amended to the marsh setup. Next slide. Um, okay, and so this is part of a larger effort to do a economic valuation. The city thinks very much about how much rent uh, they get from their property. They, and this has always come up in their discussions that we've had with them. Uh, and so the question is, you know, can we put up, can we assess what the value is of restoring marsh? Uh, what is that dollar value that we could put up against the city's rent value? Uh, and there's a couple of different uh, components to this. One is this business about creating a green wall or a living shoreline, you know, to protect city infrastructure, that $1.2 billion of infrastructure in the future. Um, the second is carbon sequestration, as I just mentioned. There's also water purification issues. Rose Creek is one of the most polluted waterways entering Mission Bay. Uh, and so by uh, using the marsh essentially as a filter, we might be able to greatly reduce the amount of pollutants entering the bay. Um, there's also fisheries enhancement. So it's not just killifish, fish, but there's a lot of commercially and recreationally important fish that spend their larval lives in the tidal channels that you see uh, in the photograph. And so what is that value? You know, the recreational fishery is big in San Diego. And so if we could figure out, you know, what a hectare of, of marsh means in terms of fish production, uh, then that could really be, uh, could turn some heads, I suppose, uh, in a part of the community that might not really think very much about marsh restoration as being important. Um, and then the final thing is tourism. You know, what is the value uh, uh, of, of tourism of doing marsh restoration, of essentially creating a different kind of venue than we have anywhere else in San Diego um, in terms of, uh, for example, for bird watchers. Uh, I'm a bird watcher. Uh, it turns out that we bird watchers are tend to be relatively wealthy compared to the general community, uh, and and as uh, as tourists, you know, we're fairly valuable to the community. So that's just one thing. There's many other aspects of tourism that we can also put a valuation on. Next slide. Um, here's another experiment. Uh, this is actually this is not Kendall Frost. This is Georgia. Uh, but here we see a dredge which is operating in this tidal channel and is blowing sediment that has been dredged out of the tidal channel onto a, a marsh. Um, and this is called thin sediment augmentation. So it's adding sediment to a marsh to allow it to aggrade and keep up with sea level rise. And this is a critical thing if we're going to do a green wall kind of uh, uh, you know, effort to try to prevent uh, damage from future uh, storm flooding. Uh, and so we'll, we will be doing experiments like this. And then as I also mentioned, the carbon augmentation idea. Next slide. Okay, whoops, go, go back one. Uh, so I was, this is a picture I took a, a couple of weeks ago uh, out in uh, Ocotillo. And uh, these are our members, okay, of 13 bands of the Kumeyaay Nation uh, from both sides of the border, as it turns out. Uh, and they used to have this tradition of going from the desert to the sea using uh, you know, desert resources at one point in the year, mountain resources at another time in the year, uh, and then uh, marine resources and coastal resources uh, at still other times. And, uh, and we can help establish that connection again for them. And so I've been in discussions with the Kumeyaay um, community to, to see, you know, how we could use the, the uh, reserves to give them uh, that connection to the ocean, because of course, 
you know, coastal lands are almost completely developed. And so there's very few places where, you know, this kind of cultural tradition could be reestablished. But the new community center, the new uh, field station and education center that we're trying to build is ideal for this, okay? And that's what I've been trying to sell uh, to the um, Kumeyaay that they, they should use this field, field station when it is constructed. Next slide. All right, so this is just a little summary. Uh, so we're in the middle of these four major things, okay? One is this economic valuation to try to push back uh, with the city about the value of doing marsh restoration. Um, this value, of course, of carbon sequestration for the city's climate action plan. Um, experiments to figure out how you could increase carbon burial and make a better green wall in the future. Um, and then also this uh, outreach to the uh, Kumeyaay uh, about native uh, Californian cultural traditions. And there are other elements besides just Kendall Frost, but that's, uh, that's a key one at the moment. So that's my presentation and I think I'll turn it over to Heather. All right, thank you, Dick. I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, I was supposed to mention, by the way, before Heather starts, that we will be happy to take questions, uh, you know, after Heather's presentation. Yes, of course. Well, thank you very much, Dick. Um, yeah, I'm the executive director of the UC San Diego Natural Reserve System, and um, thank you all for coming and spending time with us. So I'm going to talk about... Um, just a few of the outreach and education programs at Kendall Frost Marsh, a few of the things that have been going on in the last year. And also I'm going to share some more details about the, our progress with the building. But before I do that, um, I'm gonna just spend a few minutes talking about what the animals at the marsh have been doing in the last year. And this bird on the left is the Ridgeways rail. It's a uh, federally listed as endangered species, one of two endangered species at the marsh. Another, the other one is the building savanna sparrow. This bird is a marsh, a wetland specialist. It can only live in wetlands, hence the reason why it's endangered. 90% uh, of wetlands along the west coast have disappeared. So this bird is, suffers, this bird really suffers from habitat loss. The picture on the right is an artificial nest platform that we humans build for these birds to encourage them to breed. Um, so, um, so if any of you, I know some of you have been at Kendall Frost, some of you haven't. For those of you who have been there, um, you've seen these marsh, these, these nesting platforms, they're out in the, they just look like, like little blobs, little lumps out in the very low tide area, out in the cordgrass area of the marsh. Um, and and um, this is what they look like from the outside. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of what goes on on the inside of one of these nesting platforms. So I'm gonna first make sure my volume is down because this starts out pretty loud and it starts out with the birds um, calling, their typical Ridgeways, Ridgeways rail call. Um, and I'm gonna show you, it's a minute and a half video. So here we go. So you see two adults here, both the male and the female participate in uh, the rearing of the young. So that's probably what, what's here is the male and the female. So how old are those, those kids, Heather? You know, you I don't know. I don't know the date of this. I'm assuming that this video is from probably midsummer, like late July. And I don't know how old these are. If they were chicks, they'd be, you know, a couple days old, I'd say, you know, for like chickens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They sure are cute, though. <laughs> <laughs> Into the water.
<laughs> All right. All right, enough of that. Um, okay. <laughs> I love oh, the- oh, oh, there we go. Okay. So, uh, picking up the kids is a uh, really great. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a great parenting strategy. I wish I had that when my kids were little. <laughs> If they don't obey, just pick them up by the neck. Um, anyway, so this year in 2020, we had seven breeding pairs at Kendall Frost Marsh, um, which is, we've had more, we've had less. The high was, I think, th 33 breeding pairs is our max, which was in the 80s. Um, although it just fluctuates wildly from year to year. So the low was, I think, two breeding pair and every year is just completely different. We had, we also had 30 breeding pair, I think in, I have written down in um, 2016. So, um, but the, these birds really depend on marshlands like Kendall Frost for their, for the very survival of this species. So it's just so important. So anyway, so that's one of the things that the animals have been doing at Kendall Frost. Now I wanna go and turn to what some of the people have been doing at Kendall Frost in the last year. Okay. All right, so many of you might remember um, there was an international climate march last September, largely organized by young people, and indeed high school students and others from Mission Bay marched to the marsh to demand action on climate change. It was very inspiring. We had our annual, uh, our biggest annual outreach event uh, last year, this year in February, Love Your Wetlands Day. Uh, I love your wetlands day happens in February because um, the rail, those rails that we just saw, their breeding season starts in the end of February. So this is sort of our last gasp chance to get out in the marsh before we kind of try and um, give the marsh over to the birds for a few months so they can breed. So they're more likely to breed in the marsh. So this year at Love Your Wetlands Day, we had a number of um, elected officials speak. We had soon to be mayor Todd Gloria, uh, and we had city council member from that area, uh, uh, D, which is D2, Jen Campbell. We had state assembly member, Dr. Shirley Weber. We also had Congressman Scott Peters speak. Now he's not pictured. Um, we also had um, lots of student volunteer groups manning booths. For example, we had the city college students um, uh, uh, from the city college Audubon Society showing off birds of the marsh. And then we had hundreds of volunteers who come to go to visit the booze and who listen to the music and everything. But the highlight is really the chance to volunteer to go and pick up trash at the marsh. So they do this both by kayak, by sea, and by walking uh, into the marsh. And um, hundreds, of, literally hundreds of people participate and everybody has a great time. Everybody loves to get into the marsh and they love to feel like they're uh, helping out and doing something rewarding. So it's really a great, great time. Now, Kendall Frost Marsh has a long history of collaborating with Mission Bay High School, but we've, they've started something new this year. Uh, in September of 2020, they started a new project-based curriculum that every ninth grader at the high school is participating in. And um, the focus of this curriculum is Kendall Frost Marsh. So what they're doing is they're creating, they're considering the marsh as their client and they're creating outreach materials for us. So they're gonna learn everything they can about the plants and the animals and the ecosystem services and the carbon sequestration, et cetera, et cetera, at the marsh. And they're gonna summarize that information, that knowledge and uh, create an engaging website and then um, put these QR codes around the perimeter of the marsh. And so then the public, the passersby, can uh, use these QR codes to connect to their website and find out what is the marsh all about. So this is an interdisciplinary project. It's not just their biology class, but it's the biology class, it's the art class, the English class, the government econ, computer science, engineering class. And it's a project that's going to last several years. So we're super excited about that. We are also piloting a uh, UC San Diego student docent program at one of our other reserves, but we hope that this pilot, that we can transfer this pilot to a program in the future at Kendall Frost Marsh, so we can open up the marsh uh, to the community much more frequently than we're able to do now. And we're continuing uh, uh, 
trying to work with local industry uh, on the marsh. So last month, I, for example, last month I attended Blue Tech Week, which is sponsored by the Maritime Alliance, a coalition of local industries that either work in marine science or supply products to people that other people that work in marine science. And I've um, just this week, I'm going just Friday, Friday, I'm going to have a phone call with a local startup about getting students involved in a program to um, clean up plastic, clean up and monitor plastic pollution in Mission Bay. So I teach, I have taught a lot at Kendall Frost Marsh. Uh, I've taught, as have many others. I teach a lot of uh, UC San Diego classes at the Marsh. I love teaching at the Marsh um, and I love it because the students love it. They always say, whenever we go down there, they say at the end of the quarter, that's their favorite thing they did. Um, so it's really great in almost all respects, except the building. <laughs> so this house trailer is just really inadequate for any kind of teaching. Uh, the largest room in the trailer can hold maybe six, seven, eight people at the most. So we can't really use, so a class can't use the trailer at all. Um, so let me paint you a picture of how, what we do when we do go down there. So of course I need to talk to the students. Once we get there, I need to talk to them about what we're doing. Um, we need to have a discussion. So generally what I do is we go down there. There's a, there's a little skinny narrow deck on the east side of the building. So what I do is I line the students up on, on that deck and kind of single file because of the deck is so skinny. And then I go down into the marsh kind of where they're standing now and I shout up at them. <laughs> and, but the problem is there's traffic on Pacific Beach Drive. Um, so half of them can't hear me. Uh, if it's the morning, there's, the sun is in their eyes, so they can't see me. So it's really um, doesn't work very well. So it would be so nice to be able to have a classroom where we can really engage the students instead of just kind of muddling through, which is what we do now. So this is the building where we hope to do this. And you've seen pictures um, of this from, from Dick and Kit. Um, so this is a concept drawing. It isn't necessarily the final picture of what the building is gonna look like, but this is what we'd like it to look like, something like this. Um, the building is going to be modular. Uh, and we're doing that for a couple of reasons. One is it's cost effective. And the second reason is a modular, modular building is built elsewhere. And so that means that construction impacts, that means that there's that really that kind of construction minimizes the construction impacts on the site. And since we're building right next to a wetland, that's super important for us. We're planning on the building being about 1700 square feet. So that's about the size of a modest house. Um, the site is more or less where the current house trailer is, although the architects did uh, something I think is brilliant and they angled the building on the site, as you can see. And they did that to make the most efficient use of non-wetland space and have, make sure the building had no impact on the wetlands. Okay, here is our concept floor plan. And again, all of these plans, these are just ideas. These aren't necessarily what the final plans will be, but this is what we'd like them to be. Um, so the hallmark of this building is that it's going to have both public and private space. Oh, and before I start, I should say, so in this picture, um, let's see, uh, uh, Pacific Beach Drive is here to the north, and then Crown Point Drive is on the, wet, on the bottom of the slide in the west. Oops, whoa. Okay, so, um, so when I say private space, I don't really mean private, I mean space where researchers can, um, can do research and secure really expensive equipment and valuable data and that kind of thing. So the, the researcher space is the north end of the building. So there'll be a couple bedrooms, number of rooms, one, one, in, one in one here, an eating area, bathrooms, and this will be the research workspace, room five here. And again, this is space that can be locked, can be secured, so we can put um, valuable equipment in there, which is really important for the researchers that use this space. And then the south end of the building is going to be the public space. And the star of that show, as Dick mentioned, um, is this multi-purpose room, which is room eight here. Um, now this room will have um, uh, on this, so the marsh is all uh, over here, okay? So this room will have uh, uh, big glass doors that open like garage doors. So the room will have a real indoor outdoor feel and it will open up onto this deck. So it'll, that will be very nice. Um, and then uh, room six here will be a reception area and room seven will be a storage area. And this room 
is uh, really built to be as absolutely flexible as possible to accommodate as many different kinds of groups as possible. So let me give you an example of how we see this room being used. So for example, say we have one day we have a high school group uh, come and they're gonna do some research in the marsh. And so they need tables and chairs to lay out their samples. Okay, so we've got tables and chairs. So then the next day say um, there's a public lecture uh, and so that group just needs a chair. So we put all the tables away into the storage room, into room seven. And say the next day we have a kindergarten group come. And so those teachers don't want any furniture at all. So they just want carpet squares. So we put all the furniture away. And maybe the next day we have a, maybe the Audubon Society wants to have a volunteer appreciation gala. So they are, you're gonna use this space and they have this reception area where a caterer can set up food. So that's how we envision this room being used by any number of different types of groups, education groups, community service groups, any groups that are involved with the marsh. And the whole building, of course, will be ADA compliant. So we have made quite some progress on planning that, the building. So we have an architectural firm hired, uh, Mosher Drew. We have a general contractor, DPR Construction. Uh, UCSD has, uh, the UCSD planning department has made great strides in doing the CEQA work that's required. CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act, and it requires in any project such as this, identify and disclose any environmental impacts. And so in order to do that, um, a bunch of surveys had to be done. So, and most, I think all of those surveys are done. We've done the biological survey, the cultural resources survey, the geotechnical survey, a topographic survey. Um, so those have all been completed um, by the UCSD planning department. Uh, we will, since it is next to the coast, we will have to apply for coastal development permit uh, to, to the Coastal Commission. That can't really start until we have 50% construction documents and we don't have those yet, but as soon as we do, planning will start that. And, and working with UCSD planning has just been fantastic there. It's a dream to work with them. They're so good at this. So the next step in our construction um, planning is to hire a modular company. And our goals are to actually start construction in about a year in January of 2022 and then complete construction about six months later. So um, uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, for your enthusiasm about the marsh. And now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Chris Sickles, uh, Senior Director of Development. Thank you, Heather. So I wanna uh, introduce myself again. So my name is Chris Sickles, for those that don't know me, uh, Head of Development for Biological Sciences. About a year ago, I uh, started this position. And in the first week, I went out to the marsh. And there was a party that was hosted by the victors and led by Edie Monk. And about 75 to 100 people were there to start the process that we're, we've been going through for the last year. So that was the, uh, the initial inspiration for me to jump into this project. Since then, I've met some wonderful volunteers at the different events, including uh, the Love Your Wetlands Day. You know, I was really happy to see the, the Mission Bay High School students lead a climate change march, march and choose our marsh as their location or their natural spot to, to rally uh, for climate change. And then I've met some wonderful volunteers, uh, one of which I remember early on, there was a luncheon with about 10 folks talking about how are we ever gonna make this happen? And at that time, we all were a little uh, skeptical, I'd have to say, about the goals that we had to overcome. So uh, we got to work and started to do really a grassroots uh, or marsh roots type of a outreach and before we knew it, we actually were able to get to the minimum challenge from the state natural reserve. And so that was a big milestone to be able to get the matching funds secured. But the matching funds aren't enough really to get the type of building we want ultimately. So as you saw from the, uh, the slides that Dick and Heather were talking about, this is really a community learning center. It's gonna be open for so many different audiences. It's gonna have nonstop action. And it's gonna be really a pillar for us as we talk about climate change. And as the university leads that effort in the San Diego area and beyond. So uh, we are in the permit and architectural planning 
stages. As Heather mentioned, that's extremely exciting. There's some flexibility in the design. And I love the fact that, again, it's going to be a flex building. Uh, and we should have it, as, you, as Heather mentioned, relatively quickly. So we've made remarkable progress. Uh, this project, a couple of times, we said, well, we're, we're already hit our goal. Uh, but bottom line was some of the funding that we have disappeared due to COVID-19 related issues. So we went back to work a couple of times. And at this point, I'm not sure if you can see the slide that shows our numbers. So at this point, we have made remarkable progress considering it's been a little over one year since we started raising money for the project. $1.6 million goal and we raised over a half a million so far. You, you put the matching funds from the Wildlife Conservation Board in, and we're sitting at a 1.5 and some change. So that leaves us with about $90,000 to raise for this project. So that's a remarkable achievement, but we still need to raise that $90,000. So my uh, my messaging is, first of all, the development team is here for you. And I wanted to thank all those that have already made contributions. We uh, would love it if you brought people that you think might be in, interested in this project to us to, to broaden our, our funding base. We, um, we're looking forward to the day where we're stick, putting a shovel in the ground to break ground on the new facility. And we're only $90,000 away from that. And then if you look ahead until the ribbon cutting, and I'll do a little gesture there with the big scissors, imagine what's gonna happen after the, the minute we open up that building, the, the flow of people that will be coming to the new Kendall Frost Field Station and Learning Center. So that is what's in, been inspiring me. I personally have made a contribution and I can't wait to host all kinds of different events out there post COVID-19. So again, thank you everybody. Uh, are there any questions that you might have for me? Are there any deadlines in for the fund? Yeah, I mean, in, in an ideal situation, we'd like to have all the funding uh, wrapped up by the end of January to keep on our construction and permitting process. Any questions for Heather, Dick, myself, Kit? All right, I'm gonna turn it over to my favorite Dean. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, so, uh, and thanks so much to Dick and Heather for your inspiring presentations and to each of you, each of our guests here today who have made um, impactful contributions to really make our vision a reality. Our goal through this project is not only to build a new space for, to, for research and community engagement around this precious wetland that's remaining, but really to, to build the partnerships needed to make San Diego a leader in this, uh, in responding to climate change and restoring these critical marsh habitats that are so threatened globally. And especially in California where we've lost more than 90% of the wetlands that not only protect us from um, sea level rise, but also form critical habitats um, for endangered species and the breeding ground for commercially important fish. And so thank you for your partnership and helping to make this, this vision a reality. I really do think that San Diego can be the global leader in this area and that through this project, which we're launching here today, thanks to your uh, generous contributions and your um, generous uh, sharing of your network and community of supporters with this project, I think we can make San Diego the leader in this area and in restoring this critical habitat so it can serve um, society and restore the connections of native peoples to their lands. So thank you so much. I'm grateful. Um, I'm really grateful to be Dean. Doing projects like this is one of my favorite things to do as Dean. And I'm so grateful for each of you um, for your connections to UC San Diego and to the Kendall Frost Marsh Reserve. 
And thanks again to the families um, who had the vision to preserve this land so that we could have this conversation here today. Thank you so much. And have a, have a wonderful and safe holiday season. And um, I, I hope to see you all again in person at the reserve so we can enjoy this beautiful space together in celebration soon. I'll stay on if anyone has, has any other further questions. Right. Me too. Right. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank <laughs> have you. a great holiday and please feel free to call us. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Chris and Liz, thank you uh, for your recent contribution. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I have a question, and that is, presumably there's going to be an, an exhibit in the building for the public to look at, um, you know, with pictures of the birds and things like that. Will there be certain opening hours, and who might be staffing it during that time? No. I think I, Chris, I think I can answer that question. Um, so, but I didn't quite hear you. Did you say how is the marsh going to be open to the public, basically? Exactly. I mean, you're yeah. going to have an exhibit room, presumably, or at least a room where people can go in and see the stuff. And will there be certain opening hours and people will have to staff it during certain times? What will happen there? Yes. So we are, so that's what I mentioned, that docent program. So we're hoping to have both community volunteers and student docents who are there who can open the marsh up and on a regular basis to members of the community. So right now, well, of course now because of COVID, it's not open at all, but pre-COVID it was open. We had um, a work party the first Saturday of every month. Isabel Kay managed that. It was really great and very well, shockingly well attended. And people did things like planting native plants, you know, and, and you know, removing invasives and stuff like that. Um, and refurbishing the, uh, the rail nesting platforms and stuff like that. Um, we hope to open it up, say, um, I think like, what I would like to start doing is opening it up every Saturday morning, you know, certain hours um, with, again, with volunteers, with student, UCSD student volunteers, with community members. So then um, the neighbors, anybody can come in and watch birds, learn how to watch birds, learn about the marsh ecosystem, et cetera. So that's what we, what we hope to start with. Um, and then um, we'll go from there. I mean, we, I would love to open it up as much as possible, um, uh, uh, but that's what we hope to start with as soon as um, kind of, as soon as we get the new building and as soon as, which hopefully the COVID will be well over by then. <laughs> Have you reached out question. to the local Audubon group? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of work with San Diego Audubon. They've been a, a great partner through this whole effort. Uh, and, uh, and so we are part of uh, now, well, there's one grant proposal to the Ocean Protection Council that was put in uh, by San Diego Audubon in collaboration with us. Uh, and then there's another um, a grant opportunity also that will put in a proposal for that we actually had a, a planning letter that they, the, uh, the foundation thought was a, a good enough thing for a, a submission of a proposal. So we've been doing, yeah, they've been a great partner to us, San Diego Audubon. Uh, and, you know, they've of course been leading the effort on, uh, the, re, on the rewild effort, uh, which is sort of the foundation of, of some of the research that we're trying to do to support that effort. You know, for example, doing these economic valuation uh, studies, uh, the carbon sequestration studies are all kind of based around um, trying to back up uh, the Audubon Society's um, uh, political and, and planning effort, you know, for marsh restoration. And I think uh, Kit said this already, but I, I think that, you know, this building is the key because it helps what we really have to do for the to make uh, this whole sort of political process work is we need to build friends and relationships. This is the key key issue, uh, and you know we're we have a lot of connections like that. It's not like we're starting from scratch, uh, but um, but the building allows us to build those relationships between the university and the broader community much 
better. Uh, and we know that a, a major marsh restoration effort probably won't happen for another, oh, I don't know, six or seven years because of the way the city has dealt with the uh, Gelfin family and the Campland um, uh, RV park and so forth. Uh, but that's fine because that's uh, the timeline that we need to actually build a the strong community relationships to uh, get the funding in place, uh, the planning in place, all that kind of stuff. So, I think that this is the building is really a linchpin in that because it really it makes the connections uh, work for us as a university uh, to the community. Yeah. yeah, I would like to just yeah ditto that. I agree with everything Dick said. Go ahead, Liz, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just wondering how big is that room? The, the, the multi-purpose room, room, your it, big room. The big room is uh, right now how in the many? plans, it's 500, Please? it's 500, sorry. It's 572 square feet. It's almost right. 600 square feet. And that's the inside. And then the deck will add additional space as well. It's designed for a class of uh, around, you know, 25, 30 students, something like that. And we, and that was done actually because uh, we had this, this wonderful longstanding relationship with Steve Meadows over at um, Mission Bay High School. Uh, Steve was their Marine program for a long time, but he retired, but they're still doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Steve says, you know, well, I'd like to bring my class over there and, you know, be able to muck around in the marsh. Uh, and so that was, you know, the impetus, one of the impetuses behind trying to get that, uh, that, that big room uh, established, as Heather pointed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so different because right now, as I said, there's no room. The trailer right now, it's just a house trailer. So it's a bunch of little rooms. And so you can't, you know, maybe you can fit maybe 10 people if everybody's standing up. But if people want to sit down, it's only like six or seven people. So that's why what Dick said is that building is really a, a key component is we have to have somewhere where we can at the marsh where we can meet with groups of people to, you know, further to expand our, um, our relationships with the community, even though we already do, um, you know, have a lot of um, interactions with community groups, but really to expand on that, we need a space where we can meet. And that deck space is such a great indoor outdoor uh, resource compared to the one we have now, which is, you know, so narrow. It must only be what, five feet where the yeah. chairs are leaning against the wall versus, you know, having that wonderful deck pointing out towards the bay. So that to me, I thought was a really smart move to build a deck in that type of a shape and have it indoor outdoor. And I love watching your slides, Dick, when you talk about, you know, this being the anchor and then what's possible for that whole north end. Yeah, actually that's something too, you know, I've been, uh, I'm a dreamer. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, the the original sort of scheme that I showed you that I had put together, you know, includes a, a big a public uh, education facility. And we've actually, it's been fun. We work with the uh, new school of architecture and design to have their students design that building. Uh, and they came up with all kinds of great innovative stuff which I can tell you, I plan on floating past all the members of the city council and the mayor and so forth as concepts of what we could do in terms of a larger public education facility. And I mentioned the part of the stuff about economic valuation of tourism. And it turns out, so when I talked to Richard Carson, who's a natural resource ec economist at, at uh, UCSD, <laughs> he says, you know, one of the biggest values is what's called gate. You know, it's if you if you have a new venue, you increase the value of, of the tourism dollars coming into every other venue because it means that this tourists have kind of a circuit that they can do. And um, and so he reckons that there's that we'll figure out what that value actually is, you know, but uh, it would increase, for example, the amount of money that SeaWorld takes in if we were to have a nice um, public venue uh, in Mission Bay on the north side. Uh, so anyway, it's fun, you know, to think about all the different things, ways you can impact the community. Now, I'll just say I view this really as UCSD returning to its roots as a public research university, really 
building strong ties with the community and seeking to serve the community and, and advance the, the well-being and the economic vitality of our region. So um, this, is, this new building will help us form really deep ties and, and new kinds of ties with the local community. And so I'm so grateful um, for Dick and Heather's leadership in this area and really do look forward to um, seeing what we can do to build upon this platform and make, make the vision, the longer, even longer term vision a reality. It's really exciting to me. There's some other, I, I, I've been talking too long, sorry, but I, but one more thing I just have to cram in here, you know, is that the city, of course, is redoing all their transit system, and there will be a, a trolley stop that is, uh, you know, basically pretty close to the, where the golf course currently is, and uh, so that, you know, if we did an extensive marsh restoration, then that would mean that the marsh would be available to everybody in the city. Uh, by just taking the trolley, <laughs> uh, which I think is brilliant. Yeah, I was going to also say, um, in response to what Kid said, for you know, in my many interactions with the community down there, really, Cumberfrost Marsh for people in uh, that don't live in La Jolla, for people who live down there, Cumberfrost Marsh is the face of the university. You know, that's what they see. And it's so it's really, um, it would be really exciting to have um, more programming and a space where we can do more programming to really, um, uh, to, to really connect in a positive way with the local community. Yeah, that is so Dr. Important. Norris, um, this is Julia. How transferable are the things that you learn here at Kendall Frost to other wetland areas along the coast? Well, that's are, great. Are, they, are, they, are you learning things that are unique, uniquely applicable here, or are they broadly applicable to other areas as well? Yeah, that's a super question. You know, it turns out that the, um, the California documents that talk about doing marsh restoration or carbon sequestration or whatever, they're almost all written for the San Francisco Bay area. Uh, and the San Francisco Bay, of course, has a lot of marsh that still is marsh. Uh, they haven't had as much uh, sort of heavy impacts of development there uh, as we've had in Southern California. And so we have a kind of a different situation here where, where to do um, uh, marsh restoration means actually taking what are former building sites and turning them back into marsh which is different than just trying to, you know, make a degraded marsh live again uh, more fully. Uh, and so I think that this is a very good point that you bring up, you know, that both in terms of how we do marsh restoration may be there's sort of novel elements to doing it in Southern California that are not true uh, in Northern California. It means, Kit mentioned, you know, the business about leadership uh, for the city. And I think this is really key, you know, because we could be the community that figures out how to prevent, um, how to use uh, living shorelines, for example, to um, prevent the city from being flooded uh, and reduce city liabilities. And that could be a model for communities everywhere, you know, worldwide. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and it's, and the beautiful thing is, you know, we have all these universities in the, in the place. And of course, I'm at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, and, you know, so we can publicize that stuff. Uh, we can take that research and make it uh, broadly available to city planners everywhere. Um, so I find that extremely exciting. It's like, man, you know, this is research actually starts to take some real impact, you know, on the broader community, which I, I personally find uh, fulfilling as a scientist. Yeah, loss of wetlands is not unique to San Diego. It's it's pretty common all over the place, and everybody's struggling with what to do about sea level rise. And it would be nice if we could encourage restoration of wetlands as many places as possible. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I showed you that slide from Georgia of the thin sediment augmentation project. Yeah. So those sorts of experiments are going on elsewhere. Some of the same things that we should do in our system. Uh, and, um, uh, but, you know, everything is, 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 it has its own sort of regional character to it. The city, for example, right now they dredge Mission Bay and then they dump the dredge spoils in, um, in the landfill. 
And it's like, dang it, you know, we need that mud, you know, on the marsh. Uh, and of course that would save the city money because they wouldn't have to go and have the landfill disposal fees and all the trucking and stuff like that. You know, they could just spray it onto the marsh. And of course, I don't know if that would really work. There may be problems with pollutants or something like that, but it's a, uh, you know, we need to think about that kind of thing about how we use the marsh for all kinds of stuff that we've never thought about before. I think we thought about marshes as, as wildlife habitat. And then it's like, ah, you know, what other value does it really have? Well, you know, it's got all kinds of values to the community. Um, not to mention the fact that, you know, we could potentially start to create a way in which the community could, could, um, could really get out into the marsh. Uh, for example, with boardwalks or bird hides and things like that out in the marsh. Uh, and that would connect people much more directly to their, their coastline than is the case now. The city just published a study of the vulnerability to sea level rise. It was updated and published last December. I think it's a different study than the one that you quoted, but I'm sure you must know about it. It inventoried assets it assessed vulnerability and it also characterized them according to whether strategies are available to protect them. It didn't go, so it was, it was basically information to form the basis of a plan. It wasn't the plan, but I assume they will be taking that to the next step and start looking at specific projects that it, it um, highlights the need for. Yeah, this is one of the things that I find most irritating about working with the city. I, I shouldn't criticize them, but you know, when I first started to deal with the, with the city planning department, they weren't even thinking about sea level rise. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't in their plans. When they came out with the first plan for the De Anza, uh property that I told you about, the sea level was not something that they were really thinking about. Mm -hmm. And they now are, you know, they were forced by the, by the state government to do that assessment that I talked about, which was a predecessor to the document that you just talked about. Um, but they, they're in kind of an early phase of trying to figure out, you know, how they're going to deal with this massive liability. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, it's not just Mission Bay, it's, you know, everywhere in San Diego, uh, particularly in the South Bay. Uh, so, I think that we could we could have a big impact, you know, on how the city thinks about things. And of course, we now have, you know, Todd Gloria is behind this kind of effort. Um, we have five new city council members who also have shown their kind of green credential. So this is a great time, you know, politically uh, to to move. Um, and I think that's exciting, you know. I, I don't usually get to play with politicians. I'm not sure how easy that is, but it's it's. It's interesting, you know, and uh, and and I think that we can give them real information that that they can use, you know, productively with their constituents to to make a case uh, for doing much more extensive marsh restoration. Yeah, and Todd Glory is a good one to have in that position. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, everyone, I need to jump off the call, but I, I just wanted to thank everyone once again um, for your support and interest in this project, and thank you. Dick and Heather for your leadership. So I look forward to meet, talking with everyone again in the future about this. Have a nice day. Thanks, Kit. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> well, I don't know if there's any other questions or anything, but it's great to see all of you. And. Uh, and, and it's great to actually, I, I can't see uh, Edie, uh, uh, she's not using a video, but it's nice to see Chris and Liz there <laughs> Out, outside of our wine tastings. <laughs> They're cold stone sober at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, funny, I gave a talk the other day to the, to the natural history uh, docents, right. natural history yeah. museum docents. And it was about climate change and what's coming up, you know, for the state of California. And uh, and one of the reactions afterwards was, "Oh my God, you know, I'm scared because there's so much change, you know, coming down on us." And and my reaction was, "Well, you know, don't be scared. You know, this is uh, these are all opportunities to to do something, you know, to change the way in which we do things uh, in the state of California." And I think that that's a, you know, that's true here in, uh, in Mission Bay too. It's, it's kind of exciting in a way, you know, and to have kind of the, the impetus where you, where you can see these big dollar value liabilities for the city 
uh, that you could hope, you know, would just push change uh, in the way in which they think about, you know, some of these resources. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. All right, anything else? Bye bye. Yeah. All right. Thank sure. you, everybody. Yeah. Bye bye. Edie, Edie. Thanks. Edie? I don't know. I guess I don't have uh, audio for Edie. But anyway, thanks, Edie. Thanks, Jody. It's really great to, to see you. Yeah. Cheers. All right. Bye.